Well, good evening, everybody, um, and uh, welcome. Um, my name is Matthew Harding, and I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to see you all here, and a real pleasure to welcome you all to this 2022 Magania Distinguished Visiting Fellow Lecture. Uh, can I begin by acknowledging the country on which we meet and the traditional owners of that country, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations? I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And can I also extend uh, that acknowledgement to any Indigenous colleagues or friends who are joining us uh, this evening? Uh, the presentation this evening is being recorded. Uh, that recording is going to be available uh, shortly uh, at our website. The fact that it's being recorded and that there are so many people here nonetheless I think is testament to Professor Brookie's drawing, uh, um, pulling power as a speaker. Can I give a bit of background to this lecture series before I introduce uh, the participants in tonight's uh, lecture? The Magania Distinguished Visiting Fellowship Program enables uh, international scholars of great distinction uh, to make an extended visit to the University of Melbourne and to contribute to the university's academic, intellectual and cultural life. The program arose from a recommendation by the Mu Russell and Mab Grimwade Magania Fund Committee, the body responsible for the management of the Sir Russell Grimwade bequest. Sir Russell Grimwade was an industrial chemist by training, uh, later a prominent business person and a philanthropist. He was a great collector of books and art uh, and a great, um, had a great passion for Australian history. He was a member of the University Council of this university for 20 years from 1935 and he served for a time as the Deputy Chancellor of our university. Uh, Miganya is a house in Orong Road, Turak. It was the name of the Grimwades home from 1911 to 1955. Uh, that house, along with a significant art collection, uh, were bequeathed to the University of Melbourne in Sir Russell Grimwade's will in 1949 and were presented to the university after the passing of Lady Grimwade in 1972. Uh, the bequest supports the delivery of this fellowship program. I'll now um, say something to introduce uh, the participants in this evening's lecture. Um, we're very pleased that we're hosting this lecture tonight in partnership with the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. Um, Professor Nancy Baxter, who's the head of that school, is joining us and uh, she will uh, offer the vote of thanks at the conclusion of the lecture. Uh, Nancy is a clinical epidemiologist, a general surgeon and a health services researcher, and latterly, of course, a public celebrity. <laughs> uh, she's authored over 200 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and she's recognised internationally for her contributions to health services and outcomes. Uh, before joining us at Melbourne, she was a professor uh, at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation uh, in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Thanks so much for joining us, Nancy. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce two other colleagues who will be joining our speaker in a panel discussion following the lecture this evening. The first of these colleagues, I think, needs no introduction, Professor Sharon Lewin. Uh, preeminent infectious diseases expert and the inaugural director of the Doherty Institute. Uh, professor Lewin is also a professor of medicine at the University of Melbourne and a National Health and Medical Research Council practitioner fellow. She was recently appointed president of the International AIDS Society, the peak international organization for HIV and AIDS professionals. While on the subject of the Doherty Institute, Earlier this week, uh, our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell, announced the establishment of the coming Global Centre for Pandemic Therapeutics within the Doherty Institute, uh, forming part of the Australian Institute for Infectious Diseases. 
This new centre will pursue an ambitious research program focusing on treatments that can be rapidly adapted after a new pathogen is identified with the intention of transforming the management of future pandemics. Uh, we've all seen how important the work of the Doherty Institute is during this COVID-19 pandemic. And this new centre will further strengthen its ability to help solve these global health challenges. Uh, this new centre is made possible by the generosity of the philanthropist, Mr. Geoffrey Cumming, who's donated $250 million to the university to support this work the largest ever philanthropic donation to support medical research in the history of our country, an extraordinary act of generosity. Um, Sharon will be joined on the panel this evening by my law school colleague, Professor Alison Duxbury, who's the deputy dean of this school. Uh, Alison also serves as the chair of the International Board of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and as a member of the Executive Council of the Asian Society of International Law. Alison's area of research expertise is international law, in particular the law of international organisations and international human rights law. The panel discussion that will follow the lecture uh, will be chaired by Associate Professor Jonathan Lieberman. Uh, Jonathan has a joint appointment with the Melbourne Law School and the School of Population and Global Health. He has over 20 years experience in legal and policy research relating to global health, including collaborations with the World Health Organization, supporting countries in implementing their international legal obligations with respect to communicable and non-communicable diseases. Nancy, Sharon, Alison and Jonathan, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Uh, that's quite a lineup and we haven't even got to Gianluca yet. <laughs> and so I'll get to you now, Gianluca. It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, uh, Meganya Distinguished Visiting Fellow, Professor Gianluca Brucchi. Gianluca has been Adjunct Professor of International Law at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva since 2012. Before that appointment, Gianluca served in the legal office of the World Health Organization. Uh, he was there from 1998 to 2016, and he was legal counsel from 2005 to 2016. During his time at the WHO, Gianluca was involved in the negotiation and the implementation of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the revision and implementation of the International Health Regulations, WHO's response to the 2009-2010 H1N1 influenza pandemic and the 2014-16 Ebola outbreak, as well as institutional aspects of WHO reform. Gianluca is the co-author of the leading English language book on the World Health Organization. He was also the editor of the first research collection on global health law, co-editor of the first research handbook on global health law, and is the author of numerous articles and book chapters. He is a member of the editorial board of the international organization Law Review and the co-founder of the interest group on international health law of the European Society of International Law. In the 2022 collection, the Cambridge Companion on International Organisations, uh, Professor Brookie was described as, I quote, possibly the busiest international lawyer on the planet, <laughs> close quote. With this in mind, we're very grateful indeed that Gianluca has made time to come to Melbourne to visit us and to share his insights based on these years of experience. Uh, Gianluca, we're honoured to host you this evening, and I now invite you to the lectern to deliver the 2022 Meganya Distinguished Visiting Fellow Lecture. Thanks. So good evening, and many thanks for this warm introduction. First of all, let me say thank you to the Melbourne Law School and its dean, Professor Matthew Harding, to the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health and its head, Professor Nancy Baxter, to the Russell and Map Greenway Megania Fund Committee for the support of the Megania Distinguished Visiting Fellowship Program. Let me also say a very personal thank you to my friends and colleagues in the law school, Alison Duxbury, Paul O'Brien, uh, Jonathan Lieberman, for making me feel like welcome here. This is my fourth time in Melbourne in six years, so it's becoming a bit of a habit. 
And uh, it's like home away from home. I really come to like this city. I'm very happy to stay here for a longer period of time to explore it. I really like its diversity, its vibrancy, its arts and, and, and culture scene, its coffee. And coming from a very biased Italian, it's a big compliment. <laughs> but also for its academic and research excellence. I mean, I, I really uh, also intellectually very engaging to be here. And so let me join also uh, Professor Harden in congratulating the Doherty Institute and, and Sharon Lewin in particular for this amazing gift and in particular for research work on therapeutics. As Professor Harding said, it was one of the missing pieces during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we, we had a lot of loss, unnecessary loss of life because of the lack of credible and, and, and available uh, therapeutics. So it's good to know that Melbourne will become a, even more a center of excellence for, for this kind of research. So let me jump right in. Uh, the topic that's been assigned to me is ref quite ambitious, is reform of governance to prevent, prepare, and respond to future pandemics. In this connection, let me time myself because among my many qualities, there is not time management. So I want to make sure that I stay within and not sort of push your patience. So we had an excellent uh, full day multidisciplinary symposium last week on this very topic. And there we zoomed in, in a way, on several aspects of this topic, environmental law, one health, and so on. So this time, I would like to try to zoom out a bit. First, not to inflict the same speech on my friends that were there present last week, but also to try to look at uh, some of the, of the tensions or the dynamics that in my view have characterized these, these, these two years. And uh, they're not exclusive to health, they're not created by COVID, but they really represent these interest, different models of looking at governance, so how you state and other actors situate themselves in responding to this kind of shock. And, um, also, they embody different visions of, of global health, what it's about, who are the beneficiaries, who should invest, why, what are the priorities. These are very open questions. And I think these, these, these dynamics, these tensions have to be understood and have to be managed if you want to stand a chance to have a credible negotiated package at the end of uh, 2024, or whenever it may be, to improve our system of pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. And I use PPR because otherwise it's a mouthful every time to repeat the whole thing. Before I uh, present you what I think are three interesting tensions, dynamics, I would like to make a bit of a a preliminary frame, and that is the global health governance and also global health security as a part of the uh, bigger governance frame is seen by now clearly as what scholars call a regime complex. That is to say, if diplomats in Geneva sit at a table and they start negotiating pandemic treaty, they don't have a blank piece of paper in front of them, and they don't act in a vacuum. The piece of paper is already a lot of written on it that comes from other regimes, legal policy regime, other institutions that overlap, that have a role in governing uh, PPR, whether it's human rights, it's environment, it's security, it's in intellectual property, it's trade, it's financing, and so on. So, and states position themselves in all these regimes to try to get the best package for them. And sometimes the best package is not what gets things done, it's what gets things blocked, because they don't want to see uh, something that they perceive as a defeat. So they move the action to other institutions. I'll make an example about it later. So when we think of governance, we need to think in these complexity terms. It's an illusion to think that everything will be solved if we have a pandemic treaty in two, three years. There will be many other parts of this puzzle, of this landscape, that will have to be addressed. And that, to me, is the most challenging aspect, because I mean, we all live through it. Uh, international governance is not something rational, uh, synergistic, and so on, but things in terms of the regime complexity. So I want to bring three of these tensions, let's call it, and dynamics that are not mutually exclusive. They, 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 in a way, they run in parallel, they bump into each other, they shift, they compete, they overlap. But I think that they represent some of the um, graphic representation of what we've seen in the last uh, couple of years. The first is that global health governance, global health security, is by now seen very clearly and has been seen for a long time as what scholars call a polycentric system. That is to say, states are not the only actor, sometimes not even the most important actor. 
there are many other actors that populate this landscape. And they have very important role, uh, uh, negative or positive. And this is a narrative that goes back to the globalization theory, that by now people talk about the decay of sovereignty, the decay of the state, and so on. And health is polycentric in two ways, in my view. The first, even what governments do is polycentric. Governments are not this monolithic entity that you know, march in lockstep. Different things are done by different agencies, instrumentalities. And very often, these agencies work by networking with the colleagues in other countries, the, the system of network governance. And that's what a, a, a pretty prominent American international lawyer called transgovernmentalism. Think of drug regulators, for example. They, they work a lot together. And the mutual learning, mutual support, and so on. So a lot of this networking then translates in what, do they, what they do at home, in the public function that are discharged nationally in a domestic context. So this is polycentricity for me. And the second is a proverbial um, spaghetti bowl of global health governance. You have states, you have international organizations, you have public-private partnerships, you have philanthropic foundations, you have big uh, multinational corporations. And they give this, uh, this image of global health governance as a messy, uncoordinated, competitive field of governance, which is true, but sometimes even generating healthy competition. For example, among the uh, the, the big financing agencies during COVID they really uh, acted in a complementary way without anybody telling them from above what they should do. It was like an automatic sense of uh, multiplying their, their comparative advantage. So sometimes even reinforcing each other. So this spaghetti ball is not necessarily negative. It has positive trait. So confronted with that, go back to 2020 and how states behaved. In a way, they showed a very state-centric approach. Governments clawed back a lot of authority with very emblematic exercises of heavy-duty sovereignty. They closed the borders. They locked us at home. They block export of masks and protective equipment. They sent planes to repatriate the citizens. All of a sudden, it became quite important to which state you belonged or under whose jurisdiction you were at what point in time for your own protection, your own survival. So in a way, uh, there's a strong affirmation of sovereign powers. And some people said it's, a, it's in a good rebalancing because polycentrism has gone too far. Other people said it's a setback. But these two, these two narratives, in a way, are not mutually exclusive. They run together. The second tension, and I think it's a good segue from the first, is how did states behave? And again, go back to 2020 or 2021. There was a lot of very inward uh, unilateral action. Uh, try to hoard as much as vaccine as you can. Don't export masks. Um, engage in policy competition. And policy competition, not just across the development divide. Remember the role between the European Union and the UK when Boris Johnson more or less forced AstraZeneca to first supply the UK market and then supply the EU market. So this policy uh, confrontation uh, is at any level of, of development in different political configuration. But also, and that's an interesting um, observation that I saw recently in a, in a report by the US Academy of, of Arts and Science, the uh, policy borrowing, policy emulation. Again, go back to 2020. I'm Italian. My country was ahead of the pandemic curve. So we were hit before other European countries. And other European countries, and not only European, were clearly watching what was unfolding in Italy. First, trying to get information and data. And second, seeing what we were doing wrong, basically, or right, not to repeat the same mistakes and to do something different. So it was really policy emulation, while at the same time, uh, France and Germany blocked the export of masks to Italy. So the policy emulation did not necessarily translate into, into cooperation. So unilateral behavior, and I don't think I need to spend too much time on that. At the same time, uh, even the most uh, powerful state, even the most recalcitrant political leaders like President Trump and Bolsonaro, they could not deny that we were all facing an acute major collective action problem. We are not going to control COVID in isolation. And so while you saw this very unilateral behavior, at the same time, this country went back to international institutions to try to cooperate and to coordinate what they were doing. 
And so you have an interesting move to international institution as a frame where they can try to build this form of coordination and, and cooperation. And so, as scholars in the room know, uh, in particular political scientists are always very divided how relevant international organizations are. Are just handmaidens to the most powerful states? Do they play a role? But if you look at the last two years, I think whatever your scholarly affiliation, it's undeniable that many institutions have played a very important role in offering a forum uh, with well-known and predictable processes and procedures where states could uh, discuss and cooperate, offering focal points for that, uh, offering more certainty about other states' behavior, because the uncertainty is a big driver in political decisions, if I don't know how other countries are behaving, in narrowing the knowledge gap through information diffusion, analysis, guidance, and so on. So they played an important role. but. And that may be, in a way, self-explanatory. But what is interesting, in my view, is that you don't have the same suspects that stepped up to the plate. If you look what happened in the last two years, to me, an interesting uh, observation is the marginality of the United Nations. Even taking into account the paralysis in the Security Council for a long time, even the General Assembly adopted a few very wishy-washy resolutions, remained very marginal. So, you had a different configuration of institutions that really stepped up to the plate and led this attempt to coordinate and cooperate in the response to COVID. You had WHO that I think remains at the center, even though, you know, with all its limits, with all its um, the criticism and so on, but it positioned itself at the center. But you also had this club-like organization, not global ones, but small organization. And you think of the political network, G7, G20. All the discourse on pandemic financing has been led more or less by the G20. And now it has landed in the uh, World Bank that will host a new financial intermediary fund. It's very much a United States brainchild, but incubated within the G20. The G7 took important actions on trade distortions and so on. That was not all hugs and kisses. In 2020, the G7 could not even adopt a statement after its summit. But still, the action was concentrated there. And think also what regional organizations have done. Think of the European Union. Think of the African Union. The European Union has been the, the motor for a negotiating a pandemic treaty. And that is now landed in WHO. The African Union has been instrumental in projecting the message that developing countries cannot be at the receiving line of international charity, but they need to, be, to become self-reliant, to have their own manufacturing capacity, to a transfer of technology. So the point here is that these regional organizations have not only acted like clubs, just in the interest of the members and excluding everybody else, but they took political positions that have become global, that have really gone way beyond the confines. So it's an interesting configuration of which institutions have really proved their worth, have really stepped up to the plate in uh, the, the reaction to COVID. And also, and that's a resilient of my polycentric argument, you have all kinds of other actors. The ubiquitous Gates Foundation, they seem to be everywhere at the same time. Uh, Public-private partnership that led a good part of the financing, the Gavi Alliance on Immunization, for example. But think also of the establishment of the ACT Accelerator, Access to COVID Technology Accelerator, and COVAX, which is a vaccine pillar. The, they're supposed to be like a single platform for procurement, for coordination, and so on. They're being criticized a lot for having been flawed. But don't forget, they were established in April 2020, two months into the pandemics, you had some of the most important actors in the world that came together and I think took a very bold and very risky experiment. So also this was a bit of a club approach. It wasn't a global thing. There were a, a limited number of participants, but clearly with the intention of doing something that would have reverberated globally. The third tension uh, I think cuts deeper in the vision of global health governance and global health security. And basically what, what it's all about. And I would say with some oversimplification, one is the security narrative, to see pandemic preparedness and response as a form of security. And the other is to see it at what scholars global, call a global public good. And, and I will explain it. Security is, a, um, is an historical approach that precedes WHO. 
uh, European countries type to protect themselves from cholera and plague coming from India, coming from uh, the Middle East and so on. So there is this sense of protecting ourselves from the rest of the world, something a bit exclusionary. We don't share it. We want to close the borders and so on. So in a way, it's something that survived very much today. Yesterday, I, I was talking to a health historian that wrote a book on, quarant on quarantines in 2014. And people were telling her, it's wasted time. Who does quarantine in, in the 21st century? Hello. So, yeah. And that, in a way, is a typical security reaction when you don't know how, what the enemy looks like. So again, this is not to, um, to, to cast it only in critical terms, because obviously there are many reasons why this narrative is alive and kicking. But think of, for example, the international health regulation, which are the centerpiece of the legal response to, to pandemics and outbreaks. They share, I think, this security narrative, because the emphasis is very much on information sharing, assessment, notifying WHO, so passing information that can allow you to mount your defenses. If you look at the text, there's hardly anything on assistance and cooperation. What happened happened outside of WHO and very much on the north to south trajectory with the clear implicit text that the bugs come from the south and they threaten the north. So like Ebola, the best way is to isolate the victims and send some assistance. That's very much, if you want, or of course a bit in a trivializing term, uh, the, the security perspective. You have many examples of that. Think of the Security Council stepping into the health field. We had a great di discussion with Alison today. Think of PEPFAR, the, uh, the, the US President Fund on AIDS relief, uh, very much sent to Africa to try to control because of the negative externalities, then coming back to the United States. And I can give many other examples. And there are interesting uh, spin-offs of this narrative. For example, one of the, uh, the, the crucial elements of the international health regulation, and more broadly of PPR, is core capacity. Every country needs to have a health system that can easily detect uh, an outbreak of disease and then control it. And many developed countries scored pretty high these are the same countries, including mine, that imploded in a matter of weeks during COVID. So something fundamentally wrong in these metrics that did not reflect the actual capacity to control and absorb a shock like COVID. Why? In my view, because there's still metrics based on the development narrative. Poor countries will do poorly, rich countries will do well. And COVID has turned this narrative upside down where the metric that we have to take into account is not just the level of development and the level of resources. is also, and I speak again for my country, how privatized your healthcare system is. Have you underinvested in primary healthcare? Have you underinvested in public services? What, that happened in Italy. And so when COVID started, everybody panicked. Everybody rushed to the hospital or to the clinics. They became overwhelmed. They were not prepared. And they became super spreaders themselves. So, the, again, the, that to me, uh, and maybe it's anecdotal, but it's a, it's a, it's a weird spin-off for the security narrative. The other narrative is a global public goods. So public goods is a term that comes from economic theory. It <clears throat> so designates goods that are available to all, so they're non-excludable, and that can be enjoyed over and over again by anybody without diminishing the benefits they deliver to others, so they are non-rival. A school book example is traffic lights. Traffic lights have a clear social and economic role. They can be enjoyed or not enjoyed by everybody. The fact that I'm stopping at the red light does not preclude other people from following the same behavior. So they are quite common in public policy at the national and local level. But they've been elevated, if you want, to international discourse and taken out of their economic roots and turned into a more political statement, sometimes a rhetorical statement. If you call something a global public good, it's like calling it the human rights, you immediately take a high moral ground. You'd like give this the veneer of legitimacy to requests that sometimes are excludable as anybody else. So in Geneva, it's something you hear a lot, uh, in particular now that we are approaching the negotiation of the pandemic treaty. And at the global level, I think that it's a big challenge to think of global public goods. Why? Because first, you have a free rider problem. Think of what WHO does in giving information, guidance, analysis, and so on. It doesn't only give it to certain countries, give it to everybody. 
So you may not be investing in, you may be a sort of bad citizen and not notifying your outbreaks, but you still benefit to what other countries are doing through WHO. That's a free rider problem if you want. And second, because it, it runs against, I think, the instincts of many countries, there is a, uh, an uncertain a small individual benefit for a hypothetical general good down the line. It's like an insurance policy. But for many countries, it presents economic and political risks, national and international. So it's not something that comes automatically. And it's a public, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's a, it's a political choice and reflect perception of what is public, a reflection of scarcity, look at the vaccine. There are just a few, so I grab as much as I can, what is excludable and what should not be excludable. It's a very complex, um, it's a very complex term, and it's been positioned very much now in the discourse around the pandemic treaty, because it's very much at the front of the claims and the demands of uh, low- and middle-income countries. Basically, they say, don't see vaccine as something that have to be either given to you or to us. These are life-saving countermeasures, life-saving commodities that should be available to everybody. And that's in a way was the philosophy of COVAX, as flawed as it could have been. And so this debate is clearly taking center stage in the negotiation of the, uh, of the pandemic treaty. And it's interesting because certain, some of the things I've been talking about, you can construe them from a security perspective or from a global public good perspective. For example, this idea of, of the national capacities of your health system. You can see them from, again, as a form of development assistance to make sure that the virus don't come back to us. But COVID showed that every country needs to improve and rethink its health system. And so I think COVID has really projected this, this public good perspective. It's not a North versus South. And so the investment in this should be seen as an investment by everybody, not as a form of development aid. And that's why uh, part of the emphasis now, strong emphasis, is on national financing. You cannot just rely on international assistance. Every country, whatever level of development, must uh, be more strategic in its own investment, in its own capacities. And that, to me, goes very much in the sense of this global public good um, narrative. The other, again, and I will not spend too much time on that, is the, uh, the narrative around access to vaccine and so on that has been really seen in excluding others, so very much the security perspective. But um, again, uh, the experience shows that political leaders, they, they, can, they can go in another direction. I go back to, to COVAX again, uh, as the devising a single, was supposed to be the only, the single platform for procuring vaccine. Rich and poor countries alike will come to this platform, managed by the Gavi Alliance, and with pretty complicated formula on how much they pay for what, they will only buy from there. And uh, the vaccine will be allocated according to needs. Uh, at the beginning, it was 20% of the population, then 30%, and so on. And this, to me, is global public goods. It didn't work also because of the behavior of developed countries that picked, dipped into COVAX. At the same time, they had their own deals with the pharmaceuticals, so they double dipped. I think Canada at some point had enough orders to vaccinate the population six times over. That's a bit over the top. Uh, so the same issues can be seen from either perspective. And so Dr. Tedros, you will remember over and over again, he said, this is a moral failure. Nobody's safe until everybody's safe. And that was the right message from WHO. But it's clear that it's not an easy message to market, to sell. There's a need for a lot of, of international uh, uh, leadership and mature leadership on, on, on this point. So these are my three uh, diagnosis, and I hope you agree or don't violently disagree, but if you more or less are on board, so why do we need them? What do we do with them? What kind of lessons uh, in looking forward to what happens in WHO and, and elsewhere? And to me, um, and I don't want to sound like a dreamy-eyed idealist because I'm not, but I think we need to move more towards a global public good approach. Because the security approach has proved to be not only unfair and uh, inequitable, but unsustainable. We are, if we continue with that, we are sitting ducks waiting for the next pandemic and again scramble to get a few vaccines. And unfortunately, the monkeypox 
epidemic that is going on now shows again the same picture, limited amount of vaccines and African countries are getting known. So there is a need for transformational leadership and I don't think it's too idealistic. I think it's a matter of self-preservation, of being realistic but devising a system which is more sustainable and also, uh, I would say, more realistic. And we should do it at times of peace. Uh, I think that negotiating something like this during an emergency is delusional. During an emergency, everybody panics. And the, 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 the wind of opportunity of peace is narrowing. And what's happening now shows it. We're still are in the COVID pandemic. People are still dying. I have a friend of mine that teaches in an American university, and he puts out every week the number of Americans that are still dying of COVID, thousands of people. And we have monkeypox on top of it. So the, it's a very narrow, and I may say this quietly narrowing, but it has to be exploited. So I will finish with six points that are not advocacy, but I, I would like to see them more as policy option. The first is that we need to, uh, to think in terms of incentives and disincentives and the distribution of costs and benefits. That's what has gone wrong during COVID. And we have to face that for many uh, low middle income countries, COVID was not a priority. We have a student uh, in, our, in our class that has been very active in tuberculosis control in Papua New Guinea. And he said, that's a priority, not COVID. So developing countries, which are least developed, that have unbelievable burden of or communicable and non-communicable diseases, they are not prepared to invest heavily in pandemic preparedness, in particular if they think that their investment will be for the benefit of rich countries. So these are the, 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 the cost and benefits has to be um, well thought out. And in a way, the interdependence will give leverage to low middle income countries in a negotiation around this point. The second, and I go back again to COVAX, I apologize, but we shouldn't throw it away. Uh, I think it's been a bold experiment and it shows the need for a, a platform to start coordinating research and development, access to the pathogen, uh, clinical trials, regulatory approval, manufacturing capacity, and allocation. That's not something top down. It's something that requires many actors. But at least you do have a point of reference. Uh, I, I personally think, and I'm not the only one, also the independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response convened by WHO, that's one of the central recommendations. Institutionalize it. Turn it into end-to-end platform. The third is, go back to my club uh, argument, a strategic approach to membership. Not everything has to be done in a global organization. At the end of the road, there has to be a global deal, and that has to be done in WHO or the United Nations. But putting all your eggs in the basket of a global organization, when you have a very complex problem with too many participants and very different interests, it's a recipe for paralysis. So sometimes even starting with a club approach with a group of countries, be the G20, be the, the, um, the, the, the European Union, be like uh, sort of ad hoc like-minded groups, can be the way to start things and then attract the states into it. The, the fourth is, I go back again to my refrain about the regime complex. The, there is a dangerous path dependency sometimes. We think in almost like unilateral terms. Geneva also a very self-referential city. Everybody is obsessing about this pandemic treaty negotiation. And that was the only action and the only solution. Uh, as, as I said before, I think the negotiated package will be uh, construed in different institutions. We already have a taste of it with this new fund situated in the, in the, in the, in the, in the World Bank. And so there are countries, and in my experience in WHO, Brazil has been a master of playing different tables at the same time. But you need that kind of ability uh, to um, go towards a real negotiated package. The fifth is um, to overcome the rhetoric of punishment. In the last two years, you heard a lot, nobody complies with the IHR, we need enforcement, we need sanctions. Do you remember at the beginning, everybody was upset with China, we need to drag China in front of the International Court of Justice. That narrative has fizzled out a bit, and I think luckily so. Because this is a narrative that leads to defection and exclusion. Many countries will not buy this punishing, naming and shaming, top-down enforcement kind of narrative. Compliance is important, accountability is important, 
But what is prevailing now is a softer approach to that, is inclusiveness. We need to bring people in, not letting them out. And WHO is uh, advocating what they call uh, a universal preparedness peer review, uh, similar to what happens in the Human Rights Council. And maybe that's a good way to go. Uh, because the public health community is not used to more sophisticated form of compliance assessment. So maybe a softer one is a good way to start. So I think this is going in the right direction. And finally, and I will finish with that, and I think that to me is an imperative, not just for policymakers, but also for scholars, is to overcome the culture of exceptionalism that has dominated the last two years. We heard too often, COVID is a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, once in a century, uh, unpredictable, unforeseeable. And this is only partly true. WHO had been preaching like a you know, lonesome prophet in the desert for years and years and years that a pandemic of a zoonotic respiratory disease is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So the evidence was there, the, the alert was there, the, some of the blueprint on what to do to, to prevent and control these outbreaks was there. It's just the reluctance of state to invest in something that may generate uh, benefits only later. So to go in this global public good uh, perspective. But look at the consequences. Um, Investment in short-term measures that just address the symptoms without looking at the underlying causes that will facilitate the next pandemic. I almost justify underinvestment in structural issues. Um, easier to manipulate politically in a way. And we've seen examples over and over and over used to stifle dissent, to disenfranchise the opposition, political opposition, and so on. And also, which I find pretty scary, is a strong temptation, even in democratic countries, to mainstream this these, 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 these exceptional measure. Look at 9-11 and the obsession with surveillance. It was presented as something, you know, we need to uh, address terrorism, but it will go away. Well, it's been mainstream in many countries, bigger form of surveillance, very heavy form of surveillance. I'm personally concerned that this will be the narrative to mainstream this kind of population control also for public health, because after all, we need to prevent the next pandemic. And so even though this is over, there is one on the horizon. So justifying this form of, of fairly heavy um, social management. So I think overcoming a, a culture of exceptionalism, looking at underlying causes, looking at structural measures, looking at patterns of inequalities, of discrimination, of exclusion, that have been big drivers of the pandemic, I think. I think it's an imperative, both for policymakers and for scholars, to try to equip us also intellectually and, 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 and scientifically better to, uh, to prevent or de decrease the effect of, of the next pandemic. So I will finish here. I, I think I saturated you. I can see some people are glazing a little bit, which I perfectly legitimate. And I must confess my nervousness at this lecture because I saw a lot of anticipation in the, in the, in the, in the law school and, and elsewhere. I hope I sort of delivered <laughs> decently on the expectations and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Many thanks for your attention. Um, so firstly to Gianluca, um, thank you for a, a really wonderful lecture, um, so much food for thought for all of us here today. Um, it's been such a privilege to host you for these last um, 10 days, we get about another 10 days with you. Um, pleased to hear how much you enjoy being here. Um, maybe I can um, speak to Matthew um, after, is any way of extending because... Um, yeah, next, next time. Um, so as Jean Lucas said, we're co-teaching a, a Melbourne Law Master's subject at the moment called Law and Global Health Security, and I can see uh, a number of our students here this evening. Um, I know Jean Lucas said to me a number of times that we're really squeezing you while you're here, um, but from our side, I'm really glad that we are squeezing you because um, you're making really just such an enormous intellectual contribution to the university, so thank you very much. All right, so um, over to um, our discussion. So Gianluca's lecture is really about international cooperation. So failures in international cooperation, gaps, some successes, um, and then ideas for strengthening it, learning the lessons 
not only of COVID, but of the last um, few decades. So um, over to Sharon first. So I think it's often said that one of the successes of the global COVID response has been in what I'll call international scientific cooperation. So can I ask you, reflecting not only on these last couple of years, but on your uh, career as a whole, how do you think about international cooperation to prevent, prepare for and respond to infectious diseases? What makes it work well and what hinders it? Um, thanks a lot. And first of all, thanks for a fantastic lecture, bringing up um, some incredibly complex, difficult problems. I'm glad someone's thinking about how to solve them, but they're very difficult. Even just if I could just make a comment, that whole challenge between security and public good, I, I still think that's going to – I get it, but I think it's such a hard sell for broader populations, even in a country like Australia, but really interesting to think through it. Um, so uh, – so, you know, science works with collaboration, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think what works well in this particular area of preparedness is having things in place in peacetime. Building it in wartime is very, very challenging. And I think just like um, jean Lucas said, there were um, examples of countries closing in and doing everything internally and then other examples of really true um, global partnerships. And... Um, the areas of – I'll just talk about COVID first and there may be other areas. The areas that I saw worked really well in science were when these collaborations were established and the most – the key thing there I think is trust. So there was this underlying trust and I could name a number of um, clinical trial networks that were already established across Europe and the US and others that really did a fantastic job of – quickly changing uh, recovery in the, US, in the UK is one of those around treatments and um, there's something called – that was actually an HIV vaccine uh, network in the US. So I think this is an area that you – it's very hard to build in the time of crisis and you need to do it um, in peacetime. Um, there are a few distinctive features about scientific collaboration in uh, COVID that I think were quite novel. Um, it's talked about a lot, but the whole philosophy around access to information through preprint servers was really quite extraordinary. And um, hopefully, I think I'm quite confident that's going to stay. Um, and I think that just the nature of uh, – I know um, we shouldn't be talking about COVID exceptionalism, but it really was an exceptional experience of every country experiencing something similar. It's very different to – other diseases that disproportionately affect some countries more than others. But this was one thing that really affected everyone at the same time. And um, and that I think that also drove um, a tremendous and many examples of collaboration. So just to ask a, a follow-up, so you've just become president of the International AIDS Society and you were at the recent International AIDS Conference. Um, so c could you see um, really tangible changes? So I know it's... COVID is not HIV AIDS, but when that community came together, um, had there been significant changes in the ways in which um, that cooperation works across countries? Um, well, definitely COVID is not HIV, you're right. Um, and there's a number of really distinctive differences that have driven the strength of communities. And I think that's because of the really significant involvement of community in HIV that we haven't – community just was, wasn't as wasn't as mobilised with COVID and it affected everyone. So there's so much of that story that's part of the HIV story. Um, then you – in the research sector, you really did have these established very significant networks um, that had, had a, a long history of collaboration with each other. And then you had one – I mean, it's interesting with the International Aid Society, for those that aren't familiar with that organisation, um, it's got 14,000 members across the world and it's specifically around convening, um, advocating and advancing science. And um, it's been operational for a very long time and um, it does bind the global community together in a way that's unlike many other things. And even in COVID right now, we don't have something similar – on the scientific front to what we have in IS, which I think is very powerful. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll come back to you uh, in a moment. Over to um, Alison. So, um, changing tack a bit, 
So much of your work is about international rules for international cooperation and the role of international organisations in facilitating that cooperation. So reflecting on um, Gianluca's lecture the last couple of years uh, and the proposals that are now on the table to negotiate new rules for um, international cooperation for PPR. Um, question is how much of this um, is emblematic of the challenges of international cooperation more generally and are, are there things that are, that are unique to infectious diseases and pandemics? Um, thanks very much, Jonathan. And um, I would also like to join with um, Matthew and uh, Jonathan in welcoming Gianluca to Melbourne and introducing him to some Melbourne institutions. Obviously, coffee is one of them. But we, ooh, we actually picked Gianluca up on Sunday a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, it was after a football match. Um, I'm a Carlton supporter. Jonathan used to support Collingwood um, and so it was potentially a very long ride back home but we quickly introduced uh, Gianluca to some of the aspects of Melbourne culture. He tried to mediate. Yeah, he tried to mediate. Well, 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 uh, I, on, I, on, when on. you say I used to break for Collingwood, I, I, didn't, I didn't change on the day just because no, Collingwood just had because beaten of Carlton. That, fair enough, fair enough. So back now to uh, obviously Jonathan's much more serious question. So um, when I'm thinking about um, Gianluca's lecture and I'm thinking about well, what is the role of international law in facilitating international cooperation. Um, I think about a couple of things that come out through um, this uh, lecture. One is that some of the things are going to depend on the existence of common interests amongst countries and potentially divergences. So obviously political and economic divergences are going to be very important to determining whether or not there will be an international law solution. Another thing which I think is quite interesting, which I'm just going to actually pick up on and extend, and that is that Gianluca mentioned this idea of a pandemic treaty. That is that there will be a new treaty that will deal with pandemics, and this is something which has been negotiated and discussed at the moment. Um, and I think the most recent conference, I think you earlier mentioned um, in another context was called the honeymoon, uh, the honeymoon negotiations, uh, which is a word I've never heard in international law and negotiations before, but perhaps Jan Luca can pick up on that uh, uh, further. But what's interesting is this idea as to whether or not this should be a treaty that has very specific provisions, which are very obvious whether a country has breached them or not, or whether it should have grand general principles and we'll worry about negotiating other more specific agreements later. So that's another um, issue which I think arises in relation to health law and international cooperation. A third one is um, the ability to play the long game. And I was thinking about this idea of a pandemic treaty, which is, you know, barely a year old, I think, maybe not even quite that. Um, and I'm thinking, well, you could say this is a really in a recent initiative, something that's only just happened. Or you could say, well, global health cooperation goes back to organisations which were created in 1880s and 1890s, and that perhaps we can see this as part of a longer trajectory about how we deal with epidemics and pandemics. Um, and you talked about other potential um, regimes where we might see something similar. So I'm going to just mention two that have been very much in the news um, recently. So one is, you may have heard of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And in the last few days, there's been discussion of the fact in the news that there was a conference and that they, they were unable to come to a particular resolution. And the other one is something that we hear about quite a lot now, obviously, in the news is... Uh, the international legal framework around cl climate change. So you see two sort of potential similarities here that I'm just going to um, mention. First, obviously the interest in relation to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the interest between states who are nuclear weapon states versus those who don't have nuclear weapons are very different, okay? And they're going to have very different interests when it comes to, example, issues around whether or not we should have a prohibition on nuclear weapons. Secondly, in relation to climate change, we see divergences in states as well, and in particular in the relation to the agreements that have come out in relation to climate change, we see differences between the interests of developed states and developing states, um, and in particular those who are emitters and those who regard themselves as the most affected by climate change. Um, so we see those, you know, polarising differences um, in countries. How does that work to create an international settlement? Thank <laughs> you. 
The other thing that's perhaps common in relation to the, these two areas is the idea of what's called a framework convention. That is a convention with broad obligations and then we'll come back to negotiating specific agreements later. So in the United Nations, you have, sorry, you have the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Sorry, that's always a mouthful. Um, and that's a, a convention which has broad aims, but then they've had the Kyoto Protocol. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard about that in the news, the Paris Agreement, which have more specific aims. And that perhaps that's the model that's going to be adopted in relation to the pandemic treaty. You see the same in nuclear non-proliferation as well. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is really this fra uh, framework convention and this latest conference which we've seen in the United Nations which has just closed is an example of where um, there was non-agreement but is an example of th this ongoing desire to meet, to discuss issues perhaps coming to more specific agreements. So you s I think you see some of the sim similarities in relation to global health law and this discussion for this new global pandemic treaty. Treaty. So I suppose that's a very long answer to Jonathan's question with a bit of Carlton at the beginning, I have to admit. But it's a long answer to the question as to whether there are similarities between the global health law regime and other regimes. Um, I think there are. Yeah. Um, so I did mention to Jen Luca that the AFL finals are starting this evening. Um, so we're planned to uh, finish, uh, I think it's five minutes before the first bounce. So um, please, no, uh, nobody leave. Um, before. Jill, look, did you want to respond to either um, Sharon's or Alison's comments? Or? Now, Alison has a, um, a ex excellent points. So this pandemic treaty, uh, and so I mentioned it in passing, but I guess not everybody is following it on a daily basis, uh, was very much an idea of the European Union. They came forward with it in late 2020, and they immediately converted Dr. Tedros, the Director General of WHO, becoming one of the biggest advocates. We need the treaty, we need the treaty. But, and I was sort of observing things, uh, it was a very... Um, tactical move. Basically, I think my impression is the European Union saw the, the difficulty that created by this toxic relation between the US and China that left a big space to be filled. And they rushed to fill it with a, a very multilateral idea. We need a treaty. Let's all get together and so on. And so it was a bit opportunistic in a good sense, but not very well marketed because basically we need a treaty. Why? We'll see. Uh, and that was prevailed for a while. So I think what is happening in WHO is we are, we are paying uh, now a bit the lack of a uh, clear debate. Why do we need the treaty? To do what? To regulate what? For what purpose? Um, and <clears throat> regulate things that may be already regulated in other conventions. So is there a risk of fragmenting things even more or creating conflict and so on? This conversation has has not happened. And so, in a way, it's happening now. And the, the beginning of the work has been a bit clumsy because the, uh, there is a text available on the website of WHO, which is really a Christmas tree of a lot of different pet projects the countries are putting there. And with in my view, without a clear uh, end game uh, of what what it should do, and in particular, for example, whether it should strengthen the IHR, repeating things that are already international health regulations or not. The, the bottom line is that, um, as Alison said, there are different, and I try to say it in my lecture, there are different bottom lines. For the Western world, the bottom lines is have access to information, assessment, give us the tool to protect ourselves. For low middle income countries is, we want clear guarantees that this horrible situation of the last two years where we are waiting for two years to get the first dose of vaccine will not happen again. They are very divergent, very different uh, interest. So the challenge would be whether it will be able to reach a common, um, a common point of compromise uh, that will have a treaty worthy of its name, not just a statement of principles that doesn't protect anybody, uh, and whether we'll have it in 2024, because it's a very ambitious plan also time-wise, supposedly to be adopted in May 2024, which means to be ready by March 2024 at the latest. Uh, so there are many challenges on the way, I think. <laughs> So we talk about the cycle of panic and neglect, and I think um, common across, I think, all, all three of you about uh, it would have been better to be negotiating this during peacetime um, rather than now. Um, so coming back to uh, to Sharon, so we're talking about not just pandemic treaty, but 
uh, amendments to the international health regulations. And I guess lawyers, international lawyers, are thinking about what rules do we need. And I, go, I want to ask you as a, you know, as a scientist, as a researcher, um, where are the areas where you actually want governments to agree internationally? Um, and where would you just rather they stayed out and, um, and, and let you do your job? Well, um, governments actually don't really, I mean, very infrequently get involved with research, but where they can make a big difference is on um, collective funding. And the best example of that is um, CEPI. Um, I'm sure many people in the room know about CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation that was established in 2017 by the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and Norwegian government, $400 million to develop vaccine platforms that could rapidly adapt to a new pathogen. Actually, we're, we're sort of basing the thinking about this therapeutic centre very much on CEPI. And um, the Norwegian government came in as the first funder and then I believe the Indian government, the Japanese government, and now they have, you know, 20-odd governments, Australian government puts um, put in a ridiculously, embarrassingly low amount at the beginning. It was like $2 million. They now give a substantial more. But the power of CEPI, I think is government funding for a common good run extremely well with a very clear goal of speed and adaptability and then some very clear principles about manufacturing and availability of their vaccines. They're not perfect um, and they're an increasingly complex organisation but I think it's a great example of governments coming together to fund and ultimately drive um, research that you probably couldn't do unilaterally. Um, Jen Lucas, so you um, you mentioned the the World Bank um, and a new financial intermediary fund. So, what's the tell us what the a little bit about what's proposed there, and then how is that going to um, be related to CEPI, um, the work of CEPI, if at if at all? I, I'm not sure CEPI is part of that group, but that was again a project a, in. Uh, a political, very political uh, project, very much pushed by the United States through G20, um, basically saying we need to move away, as I said in my lecture, from the logic of development assistance because it's very targeted. We give you money, uh, and we want to know how many doses of vaccine you deliver so we can go back to our parliament and show how good you've been. So very targeted, very quantified, very result-oriented. If you want to invest in prevention and preparedness, is a long-term investment, so it needs a different mindset. And so the idea of this uh, new fund that will be hosted by the World Bank, but will, be, will have its own governance. We'll have a board uh, with representation of donors, representation of implementing countries, and they call it financial intermediary because it will not fund countries directly. It will fund other institutions. So it will act through institutions, strengthen the, if you want, the institutional framework uh, for, for, for cooperation and coordination, whether it's WHO, whether it's the Global Fund, whether it's, uh, it's AP and so on. And it's just been established in June. The, the board of directors of the bank agreed in June. And I think the, the first meeting of the board will be now in September, in a couple of weeks. And there is a lot of flesh on the bone. Not much has been decided. But the critics say it's more of the same. It's a usual cast of donors that will give money uh, in a way, in the, in the same way as, as in the past. It's not that sort of transformational change that we expected. At this stage, I think we have 20 founders, and they founded something like $1.5 billion. And the estimate from the G20 is that we need $15 billion annually for a number of years to build up the collective defenses. So some people are a bit disappointed, but I think we need to, to, to give it a chance also to, to build itself up. Thank you. Okay, so to come back um, to international rules, um, so final questions back to Alison. So, um, how confident do you think we can be that we can do better in future through strengthened international rules, strengthened international organisations? Thanks, Jonathan, for that. In the you know in, for, for the next three minutes, uh, that that'll be someone's PhD thesis, I think, um, out there at the moment. So um, it's interesting when you think about this from the perspective um, of international law. It reminds me of a um, quote from an international lawyer who's basic who's based at. Um, New York University. His name is Jove Alvarez, and he uh, said once that um, 
he's, uh, there is rarely an international organisation existing or proposed that international lawyers are not going to like. That is, that we think about international law as a rules-based community. We want to transpose, if you like, domestic the idea of a domestic rules-based community to the international level. And we like treaties and we like institutions in order to give order to that. Um, but also potentially for enforcement mechanisms. One of the questions that my students often ask me in class is, well, how's that going to be enforced, Alison? Um, and so we can think about, you know, t in new international organisations that have been cre created in the last, you know, 20 to, to 30 years. And there's, there's been a few um, that have been created. Of course, the WHO uh, was uh, came out of the International Health Conference back in 1946. But there's been some very new international organisations as well, and we see some new ones proposed in this context. And so one of the questions I suppose I have is, do we want new international organisations in this area, or are we more concerned, or should we more, be more concerned about reforming the existing um, organisations? Um, so just perhaps two thoughts here. One of the ideas that was uh, proposed by one of the re um, reports that has come out as a result of the pandemic is um, an organisation called the, I always get the name wrong on this, um, but I'm sure Gianluca will be able to um, correct me, is the Global Health Threats Council. And the idea behind this is that, I mean, the name is fairly self-evident, that it's going to be a, a, an organisation or a separate body that's going to be created by one of the political organs or come out of one of the political organs of the United Nations, and that is the General Assembly. Now, I think that's quite an interesting proposal, and I'm not going to sort of comment on whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but what's interesting about that is that the idea behind the World Health Organization, the WHO, back when it was created, was that this would be a specialised, a technical organisation, an organisation, if you like, of science, where these sorts of things would be negotiated and discussed amongst experts and they'd be removed, if you like, from the political in, um, organs of the United Nations, such as the General Assembly and the Security Council. So are we, if you like, moving back to that? You know, what will we do in that respect? Another thing which I think arises, which um, uh, Gianluca also alluded to, is the issue of enforcement mechanisms. Um, many of you may not remember, I know the beginning of 2020 seems like a very long time ago now, but one of the um, things which was raised by our then Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is that perhaps we should have, um, there was a number of proposals, a pandemic police. That is that we should have, if you like, an international police force that can go in, um, I use the word police force, you know, sort of broadly, and inspect facilities where potential virus outbreaks may have occurred um, and that we should be able to suppress them, if you like, at that particular point. Um, very few international regimes actually allow for any sort of inspection, let alone one without state consent. Inspection regimes are largely in the, um, you know, uh, chemical weapons area, so things where weapons of mass destruction. So I think it's interesting that, you know, that when we think about well, what do we look for for in international organisations? Well, are we looking for technical expertise? Are we looking for political expertise? Are we looking for enforcement? Will a new organisation have those objectives? Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, and as we discussed today, we need to go back and check the exact date in which, uh, on which the Prime Minister said that, because he may have been saying it as Health Minister. Um, so. Uh, we're just not sure. So let's uh, let's check the date a little bit later. So unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to bring the discussion to a close because um, the first bounce of the final is now about eight minutes away and I'm sure there are some Richmond supporters here, if not uh, also a few Brisbane ones. So I would like to um, introduce Professor Nancy Baxter, Head of the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, to provide some closing remarks. Thanks very much to um, to the panel. So uh, I will be very brief. Despite being a Canadian, I do understand the urgency of uh, getting to watch the final on time. Um, but first, I really want to reflect on how very special it is today for us all to be together in person. And, and I want us all just to take a moment 
to reflect on that, how much we've been through and how special this day is. Gianluca was supposed to be here two years ago? Um, two years ago. Uh, we thought the pandemic was going to be over then. Um, but, uh, but it's taken him two years and uh, it, it's wonderful to have him. And it's just so marvelous to be able to do what, what in an academic community is actually a really quite ordinary thing to have a visiting professor, but has been so extraordinary for the past uh, few years. Gianluca, you're, you're facing multiple existential crises for the world. So if you weren't the busiest international lawyer before uh, on the planet, I think um, uh, the future is going to make you even busier. And we definitely need uh, international cooperation on our multiple intersecting um, critical uh, problems for, that the Earth is facing uh, in the future. Uh, and I entirely agree with Jonathan. We have to get past uh, the cycle of panic and neglect and start to negotiate in peacetime, which is now. So I wish you the best of luck in terms of uh, um, your international treaties. I hope you have a wonderful um, trip in Melbourne. Um, I want to thank the organizers of uh, the day. So I want to um, uh, thank Casper Erickson and Emily Holt for bringing us together and making this a very smooth event. Um, I want to thank Professor Duxbury and Lewin for uh, a wonderful panel. Um, uh, for uh, Rob Moody, who's from my school, to, uh, for helping to bring Gianluca here, as well as um, to Assistant Professor, Associate Professor Lieberman, uh, and to uh, um, Professor Harding for helping host this. Um, uh, of course, I would like to thank Gianluca for coming, uh, and I really hope that he continues to um, come back to Melbourne on a regular basis and doesn't break that very important habit. So thank you very much. Thank you.